there's no continuity. Uh, the way I see time is that all things that have ever occurred in, in my life are always present in my life. The past is never excluded from the present. If I've had an experience, if I've had a relationship, uh, that's part of my permanent identity and reality. You may never see the person again, but their importance does not diminish because a great deal of time has elapsed between the relationship you had in the present moment. So that um, I think when we die, we, we make a circle. And, and often we come back to the same place, which is why I think grandparents and grandchildren are so very close, because they're looking at the same thing. Uh, everything that ever happened is now present. But it's, it's like that for me. And that's why memory is so important. It's why writing about the past is so important, because for me, it's not really the past. We want some days to waken again to that first morning when a golden sun shone on the window's ledge and with an odor that was sun and light and morning and something else, a something that made you turn to look and listen as if for the very first time, alone and cared for and free and loved when your mother was the only girl you would ever love and father would always defend. I think, you know, very simply, and it is in a way very simple, <clears throat> the poems are written in order to find the truth. Perhaps I began to draw in self-defense. Is that how art begins? A defenseless stand against the world? But that's the thing you want more than anything. What did, it, what did something mean? What did somebody mean? What did an event mean? How did this uh, affect my life? Why do I remember it still? What more is there to be understood from re-remembering it now? Uh, by bringing it into form, can I, can I make something indestructible and permanent uh, that would be of use to me and to others? Never enough light in the room with only a little hard candy to chew or refuse and a pad that I brought myself or did my mother do that? I drew and I watched and I wondered until I was as much of it all as I dared to become. Later I remembered only what I wanted to avoid unaware of the apprenticeship I had won. I think one of the important things for me about writing is that the people that I remember uh, and, and ascribe values and meaning to are really configurations of something inside myself that is formless and that by placing that on another person and identifying them for these qualities, I then begin to understand better who I am. And so the poetry is a part of that process. First I notice something, and then I, then I begin to see why I noticed it, and then how I noticed it, and, and why. And uh, without the writing, that process could, be not, could not be completed, and if it weren't completed, I wouldn't know who I am. So it's, it's, um, it's self-exploration with the intention of gaining more and more self-knowledge. Everybody brought one dollar to give Dom Galati for his birthday if they didn't bring him a present instead. Not me. I brought 50 cents. That was what my mother gave me to bring. We argued. She won. I knew one dollar was the right amount. From such decisions as hers, lifelong embarrassments were born. Just once, my father stopped on the way into the house from work and joined in the softball game we were having in the street and attempted to play in our game that his country had never known. Just once, and the day stands out forever in my memory as a father's living gesture to his son, that in playing even the fool or clown, 
he would reveal that the lines of their lives were sewn from a tougher fabric than the sun had previously known. My sister moved inside her world, lulled by the motion of the swing in the plum tree we thought of as her own. There beside my father's garden, where he spaded, planted, and pruned, myself at the arbor, and with my mother at the kitchen counter window that looked out on it all. The connections, unbroken but tangled in a skein that none of us knew life would not untangle, our troubled lives binding us, holding us apart. One thing I say about poetry is that you can't separate sound from sense. It's, they've, they've got to, they have to work together. You can't speed read a poem and understand it. Because it's like a painting, it has to be an emotional experience first. You can analyze it later once you've gotten it. Once you've gotten it in your heart, once it hit you, if it does, if it makes the hair stand up on the back of your head, then you can, you can try to understand why that happened. Because it'll never cease to happen each time you read the poem. It's a great poem. But if you approach it analytically first and then try to feel it, you won't, just like a painting, you know. So I think maybe that's another definition that it can, has the capacity to do that, to move you in a way that only a poem can move you. I was the best color among my friends in the world of coloring book art. Later, abilities, feelings, Desires that led down avenues of this kind were valued, I believed, only by me, from among those I knew before I was an adult. And that is why I dreamed as a child to get away, why I knew in my dreams that there would be a place where dreaming was done and where the results of that dreaming could be known and shown. I wandered in the streets and through the home looking for the broken twig that made a design, the color of broken glass on the roadways I walked, the sparrows that hid in the bower next to ours, and wherever I turned, the sun turned to and struck a wanton clod. You don't know till you're gonna reduce, you know, you have no idea what's coming out. That's the great thing about writing. I mean, you don't say, well, now I'm gonna write such and such a poem and it's gonna convey these principles and ideas and you know it's nothing like that at all it's just a whole mystery you know and then you find out what you really are what you really believe what you really feel what really occurred I mean that's the wonder of it you know the magic of it that's why I write well I don't think the poet really chooses so much he's chosen to begin with and then I think the, the then I think the subject chooses him because it's only when you enter into the subject that you find the correct form for the poem, for that, for that poem, because the subject is the form, and without the form there is no, there is no poem. So you're just being um, sensitive and um, uh, observant and serviceable to that subject, and, and, and then when that happens, uh, the poem results. What the hell is poetry about? Is it just about being a loner? Is that the whole thing? You know, you really wonder. I mean, what, what is it about a sensibility like that that, uh, that uh, must uh, find its own reality and truth? In other words, you have all these feelings and thoughts and intuitions and... I mean, you have all of the stuff that children have, that everybody has. And then if you want to give it shape and form, you have to you have to perfect a craft. You have to perfect a discipline, which means that you yourself have to become that discipline. <clears throat> and then it takes years of work to get to a place where it's, where it's communicable. The thing I'm, I'm, I'm uh, giving homage to is isolation, separateness. I mean, is that what the poet is contributing? He's saying it's okay to be, uh, to follow your, your star, to be alone, 
to trust your feelings, to, to believe in yourself at the deepest level. And maybe that's what the poet's saying, huh? I think the way I write is the, the, the kind of discovery that I make by, from writing is by first detailing what I remember. The city's smallest park, there behind the downtown theaters and below the street that followed the lake, with a bench or two, a patch of grass, and a view of blue water clear to the horizon. I had come from the busy city to sit on the grass alone, absorbed in the life of that place that for the moment was home. And as I write what I remember that evokes uh, a need for resolution, I might return to an image that's unresolved in my mind. As I begin to describe it, it, it reveals its truth to me. So the way I get to that is by description. In the grape arbor built by the German couple who owned the house before I was born, directly behind the house and in front of our small garden, we had family picnics. My mother had tea with her lady friends. I cleaned all the fish I caught and sometimes read a book and met with my friends and where my sister later had her birthday parties, is there still, in all the photographs and silent memories, a touch of beauty, a measure of grace in the hardest of circumstances that helped to keep all things in balance. It was special, it was ordinary, it was, after all, us. And we put our mark there, and however our torn lives may be dispersed, it will always be there, stamped on our only coin with which we barter for more of this difficult, demanding life. I must have seen the river for the first time going to downtown with my mother holding her hand and of course I had no idea what water was uh, or what it would mean to me in my life, but the moment I saw it, uh, it, it was, was uh, I was transfixed by it. And I remember the pilings having such an important uh, meaning in my life, though I had no idea what they were. And the gas bubbles I took to be large fish living in the depths of the water. And, uh, the whole thing was magical, although I didn't see it as magic, but just as some profound uh, truth and importance that I would have to explore, and which I have for the rest of my life. So I think that was the beginning of poetry for me, seeing the movement and motion of water. The seagulls traveling over my head, leaving the home they belong to, that lake in the distance, far beyond the river bridge I stood upon, peering down the muddy, turgid waters that emptied into that blue horizon. Where was home? Down river with the wheeling gulls or toward that open water that led away under a gallant sun? Couldn't I slip as easily, tunneling down that surreptitious, wheat-choked, stump-rooted river whose crevices held mysteries, a lifetime of acquainting. Uh, it was a deeply moving experience, probably the first really deeply moving experience of my life. Well, we're saying Garfield School. This is the place where I did uh, hard time. I, I never could make a connection between what they were teaching us out of the books and what I saw out the window, which was my view onto the world. I didn't realize that they could possibly be the same thing. I thought I had my life and then I had this period of incarceration where I was captive and held prisoner. I don't know if it was my imagination that made it impossible for me to uh, uh, relate to and make contact with what was what they were teaching or if what they were teaching was so drab and hopeless 
that it, uh, my imagination developed as a result. Miss McKinney was the first one who really took a genuine interest in us and taught us. I re she really showed me the significance or the importance of discipline as a form of love because I think every child deserves to be disciplined. I think it's their birthright or should be because you can't be properly raised unless you are disciplined and loved. And I think the great, of course, ingredient that, that, that made it possible for me to do anything with my life was that I was loved. And uh, the fact I was misunderstood by most people, including perhaps my parents, didn't really in the long run mean very much because the love is what nourished me and made it possible for me to become myself. Dear Mrs. McKinney of the sixth grade, hands down you were my favorite teacher at Garfield Elementary or at any school since. Your stern austere face that held an objective judgment of everything in charge, the patient way you taught out of a deep belief and respect for learning and the good books you chose to read aloud, in particular Mark Twain, and the punishment you handed out, a twin cheek twist just once with four fingers and thumbs, embarrassed us only because we had failed ourselves, for we had wisely learned from you the need for discipline and regard. Long after I left that place, I saw you once waiting for a bus, and though I returned your warm smile, I hurried on. Why didn't I stop as I could see you wanted me to? I deeply regretted it for weeks, and there are moments when I remember it still. And nothing, not poem, not time, not anything for which I might stand proud, can erase that seeming failure of feeling and regard on my part. I loved you, I really did, and I wish now that in stopping and chatting with you for a moment, I could have shown it to you then, instead of now, in this poem, in which only time and loss, not you and I, are the subject to be held. I think the physical place you take for granted, it's just there. And whatever the configuration is, you form your life within those parameters. Um, these are the boundaries and the artifacts of your life. So if you had, if you had a, a factory here that was uh, defunct, you uh, celebrated the occasion by throwing rocks at the windows. Uh, and if it was a dead end street, uh, you used it to play uh, pick up games of softball. You, you moved into whatever the possibilities were that presented themselves to you at the time. Uh, children, of course, are extremely resilient and accepting and um, do what they do with what's been given, what's been provided. Because I had very much two lives. I had the life of the street, which was America, and the life of the home, which was Armenia, and then the horrid life of school, which was neither nothing. Well, I think there was a commonality of the here and a kind of solidarity that was um, that was based on on a, on a shared poverty that we didn't think of as poverty because no one had anything. Um, we were all on the same level, which meant that sharing was much easier. 
We had a telephone before our neighbors, or at least our immediate neighbors, so we shared our telephone. And we had a bathtub before our next door neighbor did, so they used our bathtub once a week to take baths. And uh, food the same, if somebody ran out of anything, uh, we, we shared. Um, and and that, that, was, that was a wondrous thing, really. I think the neighborhoods, the loss of the neighborhoods is, is really the breakdown of the, of the culture of this country. Without that interaction among people, all you have is uh, the nuclear family, and it's, it's proving to be not enough. And where were they headed in this season of birth and death and change? And where was home? I didn't know, nor would I ever learn. For the fascination in my mind had to do not just with this, but with secrets that must be penetrated if I was to pursue these beings of wonder with the mysteries of my own unrevealed nature. What is it that children talk about so earnestly, so secretively, a sharing so complete it is outside of hearing by others or remembrance by ourselves? The ether we made with our talk, our rushing forward and back, our excitement over everything and nothing, was absorbed by the atmosphere as naturally as we were absorbed by life. Why remember it then? Why call importance to it in a poem? For this reason, it happened, it happened just as it did, and nothing like that will ever happen again. No one thought about art and culture. I mean, it was an, un, it was an unknown commodity. It, it wasn't a consideration. There were no books in the home, or in any of the homes. Uh, art for us was, uh, was the movies. And then a little later, uh, music that was uh, a level above uh, uh, popular music. Although we were into that, of course, but we, we, I got very interested in jazz at one point. Uh, I think I was saved by that. I think an artist, what, what an artist is interested in is the raw material with which to make art. But I've avoided being with artists uh, all my life because uh, there's no material there. The material is, is, is with uh, just the ordinary people who are just living their lives. That's the stuff you use to make your art with. Not at all. I don't think it's at all bad. I think the worst thing for, for young children now is that they're introduced into, into the possibility of making a profession out of all sorts of things, including writing, at an age when they should just be playing and gathering material uh, that they can transform later after they become, um, after they become old enough to see what the values are in things. And of course we were very close to downtown and we used to walk to the YMCA every night. Or not every night, but often. And we'd come in and there were two entrances to the YMCA. There was one for boys on the other side and this one was for men. And so going from one to the other door was a, was a rite of passage for us. <clears throat> the children's world and the adult world was completely separate. And we used to sometimes imagine what it would be like to be an adult. Uh, but in fact, we were, we were separate and we were cared for, uh, but the two worlds didn't mix. And there was something wonderful about that, much more productive than if we had been intentionally shielded, because we were allowed to be who we were and to go our own way and, and just be children, and to be children completely. 
and so when it was time to to be an adult we would we had been prepared just by being fully who we were while we were children and uh, I think that was one of the best parts about growing up in Racine in the 40s. I think what happens now is that uh, adults often take out their own frustrations and failures on their children and they impose expectations on them uh, that are unfair to the children. <clears throat> we'll begin to think ahead of where they are and I don't think children should ever have to think ahead of where they are. They should just be completely where they are in the, in, at the time and, and live out their own age. We used to dream about what it would be like to be an adult and I used to imagine that when you were an adult two things occurred rather miraculously at a certain point. One, you never cried again, and two, you never fought. <laughs> and uh, because we were given the freedom to be ourselves, I had my childhood completely. And then when I grew up and I began to notice the change, my generation changed it. My generation really made a mess. Uh, they began to put their expectations and disappointments and frustrations on their children. They began to groom little leaguers and little writers and little uh, architects and, and, and little monsters, really, you know, because a child should not be thinking about those things. He should be allowed to be just what he is, whatever age he is, he should live that age completely. And then because when you, you know, it doesn't last very long. It's a very brief uh, period. And then you become an adult and then you have what we ha all have, you know. And if, you've been, <laughs> and even if, if you've been cheated out of your childhood, boy, you don't have much to fall back on. There is a chemistry that binds children, making a life of friendship that is free of motives, except for the secret motive of dreams and wishes without purpose or end. Adventures shared from concealed treasures of found things and handheld maps studied in secluded hideaways. If you had nothing good to say, you preferred to say nothing at all. I cherish this in you even though I was unable to let my feelings show. Such behavior was beyond me, but your example has been an invisible guide ever since. And I have always remembered you and this trait in your character that was there from the very beginning, from the time we were little children and then growing boys and finally adults, because throughout all that time, we remained close friends. I don't know what you cared for in me, but I have known with growing certainty and gratitude what it is especially that I have always valued in you. I only regret that it has taken me all this time to express my thanks. And that's what poetry is for me. Poetry to be, to be really, uh, I don't want to say to really be poetry, but to be the best poetry is, is, it touches eternity. Poetry, you, you can't determine a poem. You can't decide to write a poem. Uh, the, a poet is visited, and he must wait for the visitation. Because if you can't do it when you feel like it, you, you don't feel like uh, you're in possession of it. But the, the important thing to recognize is that you're not meant to be. That it comes from another uh, sphere, dimension and uh, you must be a kind of an obedient servant to the to the muse to, to the to the thing itself tell me about mike caesarelian well i think everyone has the friend that one is closest to um, growing up you have you have many many friends but then you have the friend or at least that was my experience someone with whom uh, you share uh, most things rather fearlessly and openly and it makes a deep bond and also with a friend like that with all friends but with that friend more specifically because you know them in a deeper sense you really come to know who they are in their essence last night I dreamt you died but who was it 
Was it me? Was it you? I awoke not knowing. By morning the dream had already lost its speech, and, having moved outside the corridors of language, its circumstance is also lost, and must grope alone for a meaning. You were my essence friend of childhood, but the meaning of your own life was never known to me, nor could my life be known to you. Friendship, childhood, seed of life. Was it my essence that you represented, because it was your essence that I saw, and not my own? When life takes over, um, and and causes alterations in our in ourselves, in our possibilities, in our being, uh, we can we can observe that in our friends. We can see that, so that if you go away, if you don't see someone for many years, you come back, you can see both people. You can see the person they've become and you can remember and still see the person that they were. And I think that's that's a very important thing because if you can see it in one person, you can recognize it and begin to recognize it in everyone and, and, uh, and see something deeper in people. And you can see them in terms of their possibilities. And now you are dead in dream. And something in me has remembered but you are gone, my reminder, leaving me to torture forward for myself toward that light that children never name but never forget that your memory brings me to now. The other thing about Mikey Kaiserlian was that uh, because he died fairly young, I think he was about 50, uh, it was a very, very hard loss for me because I felt like also a big part of myself uh, was taken from me because a person like that knows you the way no other person knows you. When, you, when a close friend dies, someone you've known all of your life, that you've seen almost every day of your young life, he takes with him his memories of you that now are no longer in this life. They're gone. Those memories are gone. Also what goes is the memory that you shared together, his separate memories of you, and then your shared memories together. Um, it's quite a shock to face that for the first time and, and to know that you are slowly disappearing. It occurs to me why we know so much more about anguish than about joy. We remember the moments that went down deep in us and stayed and each time returned hurt, and we called this hurt that person instead of that event. You disappear through the people that you loved and who loved you, or who have left. I think a big, a big part of it is that we always feel unknown. We go through life feeling unknown, and, um, Somehow, being known that in that way in childhood, when you were both most vulnerable and also most open and fearless because you didn't have all of the protections that you put up against life, all the different fences that you build, um, you were, and you were unsecured. Someone was in your life at that time and they came to know you, and there's something wondrous in that, and you don't want to lose that. You 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 want to be able to to keep that. Um, and when that person dies, you that goes with them. Everyone, my brother, my sister, is what I felt. I had no idea how much feeling there is in my heart for all those I grew up with, fought with played with and shared, and now I see what my long separate struggle has brought me to. I had to achieve my own acceptance before I could know and understand the many treasures that lay deeply buried in the undisturbed parts of myself. And you know, a writer writes because that's the way he gets to the things that matter the most to him, the things that lie most deeply hidden in his psyche. 
And um, also, it was a way of dealing with my own grief. I know old people talk about that a lot, and I'm not old yet, so I don't, I don't have the experience yet, but they talk about more people that they know are, are, are dead than are alive. And I think a great part of what they're talking about is just that. Their own, their own, their own identity and reality has been diminished by each of those deaths. There's no one there who remembers you. You know, a great part of why I go back to my hometown, in the beginning at least, was to remember myself. Just that, but it was enough, it was a lot. You go back and you remember yourself and you go to these places and you haunt these old places and you were trying to call yourself back. All those disparate parts that have been, been lost. The dismembered parts, what is it, the or Osiris story, where, 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 they, where they go about and collect these parts that, are, that have, been, have been lost. And I think that's what it is. And it's, it's, a, great, it's a great part of what I've done as an artist, is to, to bring that back. I've spoken about that to you before, about time, how I don't see time is uh, is discontinuous. I don't see it as as the part that's past as being gone. I see it as being continuous. I see life as a circle. I don't see it li uh, as a linear movement. I see it as a circular movement. Everything I ever thought, felt, saw is a part of me today. And it's the funny thing is much of it is accessible. Do you wonder sometimes where I am? as I sometimes wonder where you are? Or do the dead not think of the living that way, the way we think of them? Our problem is we don't understand time, and not understanding that, we can't understand anything else. Maybe it doesn't matter. It's all in our heads and hopeless. But there is this feeling that comes strongest at night that we can't know each other on earth, no matter how hard we try. So I wrote the poems addressing Mikey uh, in, in, in each of the poems, or most of the poems, and, and having this kind of conversation that you cannot have with people when they're alive. The questions are too intimate, they're too embarrassing, they're too... Um, they're too invasive. Um, so you ask them in writing, which is one of the great things about writing, is that you can do things you can't do in speech. You know, you can't do in painting or in music. You can only do it in writing. It belongs to writing. It's the property of writing. And um, by the end of it, I, I felt better. I'd come to a greater acceptance and understanding and wisdom about him, about myself, about our friendship, about my mortality, and about all of the enduring things of life. But all those years we grew beside and through each other, even though we were burning toward a different light. If death had not taken you so soon, we might have opened up this question, and then again we might have not. But then you might ask, what precisely is the question? I think it is this. We must make known what we are through the material we are given to use for our quest. If we use it, it is renewed continually as we are. But if we do not, it uses us relentlessly right through to our death. Because whatever that matter or substance or question is, that we are meant to pursue, that we are meant to use. It is bigger than us, and yet it was because of this possibility that we took the trouble to be born. I don't think writing the book changed my relationship with Mikey, except in that it deepened it. Um, because it, it touched on eternal, eternal matters. And so you realize, or I did in the writing of it, if I didn't know it before the writing of it, um, is that these connections are older than we know and um, are unstoppable and indestructible. And I think I learned that from writing the book. I, I learned that 
we're connected. We've met before, we'll meet again. No, I think, you know, life is a very sentimental experience. And, and yet as an artist, you have to be very careful not to make it sentimental. But life itself is a very sentimental experience. And uh, it's, we have a heart, we have feelings. And um, each time we lose something, um, or each time, time something isn't repaired, we hurt. And the death of our friends is, is a loss, and we feel it, and we're meant to. It's revelation in the sense that you find out what you know. You know, what do I, what, how do I know what I mean unless I speak, unless I say it? I find out in the same. It's there, but it's unarticulated. Um, and of course, writing is, is greater than ordinary articulation. You have time. You can refine it. You can work on it. You can really uh, get to the bottom of it. And um, so you write to find out who you are. It's one of the reasons you write, and it works. Of the many gifts that are given as promise, none go as deeply, unspoiled by words or thinking, as the love between friends, which completes itself each day, and each day is renewed, sun and light and stars and night, whisperings, the everything that comes when nothing is needed, only life, just the day and the days we move together with all the others separate and joined, the touching as silent as breath and as necessary. No, I don't think he did live up to his potential, but then I wonder how many, if any, of us do. I think the sad part about seeing childhood friends is that you see simultaneously the person in their essence and then the person that they've made, that, that, that life has forced them to make, perhaps. Um, you see the disparity, you see the potential, you see the loss, and you see the, the, the sorrow that is life. trace the stages of development in the relationship with my father after his death which I be once I saw that it had been incomplete not only incomplete but uh, uh, left me with a sense of unease and unhappiness and and failure because we didn't connect the way we might have while he lived and it was probably the most profound thing to happen to me in my writing was to realize that because I had this, this tool at my disposal, I could reopen the relationship and complete it, that that in fact was possible. Dead now and forever, ceremony, release him to the ground where once he played in tales that have been handed down, cupped, upturned hands, lower through your spreading fingers this soil splashed man. You knew him first, that touch him last. His circling, fading time hovers over my head. His life my own, to lose or live again. Take him, earth, in final release. Toss him and catch him in your cloudy hands. He'll know your touch. His feet, when he comes to you, are sure to be bare. Well, I, th I think you do. I think the reason it's important that you understand that, 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 that all time is contained in the present, 
uh, is because um, there are areas from in your life that need that call you back that need your attention uh, because you need to work on something and if if something in your life is unfinished or was incomplete you you have an opportunity then to repair that and uh, that concerns me very deeply and uh, you know you can even repair a relationship if one person is gone that is to say dead someone you can never see again but it takes uh, it takes uh, in my case it takes the skill or the act or the tool of writing to do that but it can be done in many ways that's that's simply the way i do it then i continue to write about my father because i think the father-son relationship is the most profound relationship uh, in, in, a, in a man's life perhaps next to his marriage maybe they're comparable in importance um, but why I wrote letters to my father, you know, it's... Um, the funny thing is, these things come from hidden impulses that you don't always understand. And if you do understand it, you understand it after the fact. The same way you understand what a poem means after the fact. You actually write your way to your own understanding, which is then only available. It's not automatically given. We stand to learn more from our own work than anyone else does, but there is an assumption that the artist makes, and wrongly, that because he wrote something, he understands it. He just has a quicker access to it, but it can be lost um, if he doesn't continue to examine his own work. You know, when you're a child, you don't think of what anyone else is going through. You only think about what you're going through. And uh, everyone else is just kind of an extension of your own joy or suffering, you know. But um, my father's life, and I, as I look back on it, uh, there were certain harsh realities in, in getting up in the morning and stoking the fire, making the fire. We would keep it stoked at night with coal. We had a coal-burning furnace. And then he would have to stoke it and um, get it going. He'd have to make his own breakfast. He'd have to make his lunch to take to work. He would walk to the bus at the corner and it, would, it must have been at least a 20 or 25 minute ride to the factory bus ride to the factory at night in the dark and um, the other thing I remember is that often in the summer he would walk home I think it was about four mile walk and he would he would give me the nickel or dime that he saved on the bus fare so I could have an ice cream cone we were quite poor and um, these are things I remembered better as time went on and I realized the value of these sacrifices and, and, uh, and, and um, this, this, his life suffering. I think of him trudging off in winter snow by morning dark to wait at the corner bus stop, end of our block, and the lonely tubular light of the bus traveling the deserted streets of our town taking those early morning men to their jobs and also walking home in summer four miles of city streets from the factory gate to where I stood on the sidewalk or sometimes on the porch waiting to be greeted as he had waited to greet me pressing a nickel or dime into my palm still warm from his hand money he had saved from the fair that I was to use for ice cream or whatever else I might want. So I think the most important thing I learned in, in this new book that I just finished called Letters to My Father was that in fact one man cannot really know another man and that that's okay. I can't really, really know who my father was but that does not interfere with my love and respect for him or his importance in my life. He's a mystery and I'm a mystery. And we meet in mystery. You know, it, the love was always there. But it, it, was, it was such a disturbed relationship because I didn't really know what he wanted from me and what I wanted from him he couldn't provide. I mean, he was, he was this 
five foot one immigrant factory worker who could barely speak English. In fact, he really couldn't speak English. And I, I stopped speaking Armenian in defiance. We just had a lot of problems, an awful lot of problems. And we would fight and argue. He had a temper, I had a temper. I was probably fighting for my own identity at that time. And I saw the, um, the rupture of his own as somehow impinging on my own ability or right to exercise the freedom to, to choose my work and pursue it. No, I think ultimately we can't know another. <clears throat> but what's interesting is that in, in making a relationship, although you may be working for that at times, uh, the important thing is not whether or not we know each other, but whether or not we can make a relationship of trust and in which we share what we have and give from what we have. I've been writing poems about my father all my life and uh, our identities are so connected uh, that I could not find out who I was without knowing more and more about him and then about our relationship. Um, I think um, a writer takes on the hardest poems after he's exhausted all the easy ones. I would hear the iron clank and know you were shoveling coal into the orange mouth of the black hungry furnace. And I would roll over in my half sleep curling my body for additional warmth, while mother rose and readied breakfast, calling me to dress before the parlor vent that brought a draft of warming air from where you had been before you went off, trudging down the cold, dark street of icy, wind-swept snow in your heavy gray coat, waiting at the corner for the bus that would take you to the factory gate alone because you don't have the craft to write the really hard poems. Uh, the poems that are about things so simple and so ordinary and quiet and um, that, that they don't seem to contain the necessary ingredients for a poem, but on closer examination and with, with a, a, a greater perfected craft, you find out that there's tremendous material in the most hidden and um, unobvious places. That's what history is, a place layered with life's pains and losses, a place where experience leads to understanding and remorse, and for some only to regret and a sense of life lost. Well, it's, it's uh, you can't know anyone until you know yourself, and, and, and self-knowledge is the most difficult thing to acquire. It takes at least a lifetime to, to begin. So you can know another person to the degree that you can know yourself. No, no, I don't, I don't think uh, he needs to be an example. I think if the father's an example, you've, in a sense, uh, imposed that example on him. Um, I don't think a parent trying to be an example is necessarily going to be a good one. I think if he is someone worth uh, admiring or following or looking up to or or being a guide, acting as a guide for you, I think he doesn't know that. We are simply doing our lives, each of us, and if that life is influential in certain spheres, that's just a byproduct of my being alive and living, you know, and doing my work. So uh, I, I think that's kind of unf unfair to impose that on, on, on anyone, including a parent. I've used poetry to find myself in my life and to make order and sense of it and also to make beauty uh, of my life. I think we all have, um, we all have a purpose in life and, and, and we're here to serve that purpose, which is a purpose we're not necessarily privy to. We don't always know what our life uh, means or, or what it means uh, in the larger picture. Um, 
And I suppose that we're not meant to know. We're just meant to live it. And in living it, it's revealed to us step by step. You can never know more than the step you're standing on. But having lived that step, you're qualified to then pass on to the next step. But if you refuse the step you're on because you don't understand it well enough or you don't feel qualified or use any of the number of excuses to, to stop yourself, that's where it ends and the journey ends there. And, and that's a great pity. We have to accept the mystery and believe, um, believe in it. We have to know that there's a larger order and that uh, we're participants in it and uh, we should be willing participants.